What is going on, everybody? It's the France, and we're here for our Monday Night Raw review for April 25th, 2022. 20 years! We celebrated 20 years of the Viper, the Legend Killer, the man who was one half of the World Tag Team Champions, Randy Orton, who, if I'm correct, 20 years to this on this day, made his debut, beating Hardcore Holly in a exhibition match. So... That was his start. We've seen him go through Evolution, Legacy, Rated RK, um, Rated Rated RKO. There's so many different things. Even like the psycho, the psychopath that was after Rated RKO and a little bit before now. His time with the Authority back in 2017. Uh, what was that? 2014. I'm sorry, 2014 and 15 to now. With rated R with Team RK Bro. Anyone has been doing this. He is as Undertaker for 30 years. But Undertaker was part time since like 2010, 2011. Triple H for 25 plus years until this past until this past year when he had to put a, throw any like put his boots in the middle of the ring. Yes, these guys have been there a lot longer than Randy Orton. But Randy Orton has been full time. Since 2002. Nobody has been consistently full time like Randy Orton. Not even John Cena, Stone Cold, The Rock, or Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels took two, four years off so you can't count. And being consistently there for 20 plus years straight. Injuries here and there for Randy Orton. Of course, collarbone injury. A couple other injuries here and there. This guy has not missed a year. If I'm correct. He has not missed a single year in 20 years. I think he's had a match every year since 2002, at least once. And that's crazy to think. I also got to throw Kane in that hat too, as 2017 was his 20th anniversary of being Kane. Of course, he was the um, fake Diesel and Isaac Yankum before that. But as Kane, he was Kane for 20 years. And I think he had that consistency as well. But Randy Orton, I'm just going to be honest. Randy Orton just seems like he's like he's 20 years in the game. In his 40s, I believe it is. Yeah, I believe he's in his 40s. This dude looks like he could wrestle for another 10 years. Without needing to stop. Without needing a break. Without needing anything. Any reason other than to just, you know, retire. Like, the dude, if he really wanted to wrestle till 2032... He could do it. He looks like he looks like he's having. He even said it in his um, interview, in his promo. He's having the time of his life out there wrestling with RK Bro, being there with Matt Riddle as his tag team partner. And I don't think I've ever seen Randy Orton this happy in in, in WWE at any time of his career. This guy literally looks like he is just out there and he is just being Randall Keith Orton, and that's a great thing. So we started the show off with Matt Riddle in the middle of the ring. There were people surrounded by around with Via, Mahan, the Street Prophet, Seth Rollins, Lena Vega. Rollins was sitting in a chair by the announce by the announce desk and just had his feet propped up. Other people were out there as well. They had they gave us a highlight package from Orton's career. The video narrated by the Viper himself. We also looked at Orton teaming with RK Bro. We come back to the fans chanting Orton and applauding. Riddle brings out Randy Orton, describing him as the best his best friend, and calls on the fans to stand and clap. Out comes Orton to a big pop. He plays the crowd and plays. His music continues. We get a big Randy chant, man. Like, when Randy Orton wants to be, when Randy Orton is a baby face and he's going full in like he is right now, this dude is over like no one else. And so this is all pretty cool and he appreciates all this. It's even cooler that he was born, that he was born in Knoxville. I did not know that. He says his journey has just seen a lot of ups and downs, twists and turns, but he hopes everyone isn't getting sick of him because he's not going anywhere anytime soon. There's 20 years flew by in a flash. He's had a lot of relationships, a lot of good matches. He named people like John Cena, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, even Mick Foley. He gave a big thanks to Mick saying the one, like he, like the reason he is a, like pretty much Mick Foley made Randy Orton, made Randy Orton's career and helped shape Randy Orton and Get Randy Orton to where he needed to be, to where he is today. Mick Foley 
did with Randy Orton, like what he did with Triple H, back when Triple H was coming up and becoming the big star in WWF at the time, and they had that last man standing match, or what was it, a um, false count, there was, I think, a, a no-holds-barred match, and then a Hell in a Cell match, that helped give another layer to Triple H, he did the same thing at Backlash, funny enough, that's coming up here soon, I think it was Backlash, in 2004, where they really kicked off the Legend Killer gimmick because it was Randy Orton went after Mick Foley. And Mick Foley, that match was special because it helped get Randy Orton to where he needed to be. So it wasn't, he was just, he was just a one dimensional. It gave Randy Orton another dimension or two to his character. And he thanked Mick Foley. Mick Foley went on social media and said that was really great, um, really touching for him to say. He thanked Randy Orton for, for the kind words. There's one big difference these days is he's having more fun than he has had in his entire career, and it's all thanks to Riddle. He asked for a hug, and now an OK Bro chant hit st starts up. It says he and the fans have also had their ups and downs, but they always come back to support him, and there would be no Orton without the fans. It says he loves the fans as well. It's a fan Randy Orton chant. Riddle says he has a surprise for Orton, a second-generation superstar, has a lot of respect for Orton, and he brings out the American Nightmare Cody Rhodes, which this is a great callback to... Cody Rhodes' career early on because Cody Rhodes came in as, honestly, when he came in, he was teamed up with Hardcore Holly as Hardcore Holly's apprentice, um, protege, and honestly, he felt like just a normal, he just felt like a white meat baby face. Like a bland white meat baby face until turned on, he turned on, on Hardcore Holly to join Ted DiBiase and then eventually they joined up with Randy Orton and made Legacy. And that, and, and all in all, the Legacy faction didn't really help Cody and Rand, uh, Cody and Ted as much as it should have. It did help, Co I think it helped Cody. It helped Randy Orton become a bigger baby face by the time it was over with. But I think it did help mold Cody and give Cody a little bit of an edge to him. To help him later on. He comes to the ring wearing a suit. He enters the ring. They hug in the middle of the fans' pop. Riddle loves to see it. Rollins immediately comes up at this, out of his chair and he's like, Isn't that cute? He warns Orton not to trust Rose because he's here to steal Orton's spotlight, not to lo show love. Like he tried to steal Rollins' spotlight at WrestleMania. Rollins is in the ring now. He says, Not everything is about Cody. He laughs and says, Tonight specifically is about Randy Orton. He's dressed in, in, up in his finest to celebrate what a career Orton has, but a career that is in the past. Because Orton is not the present or the future, and neither is Rhodes. No. Seth Rollins, not even Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins, Cody Rhodes, and uh, Randy Orton are not the future of WWE. They're, they're here and now. Austin Theory is the future of WWE. Braun Breaker is the future of WWE. Carmelo Hayes is the future of WWE. Tony D'Angelo might be the future of WWE. Yes, I haven't been watching NXT, but I know who the fuck these four guys are. Three, three guys are, plus um, Austin Theory. But, but those four guys are going to be the, the, if you want to say, pillars of what could be WWE. Braun Breaker, absolutely. Uh, Austin Theory has been, has been signified as the young John Cena by Vince McMahon. And if Vince McMahon says you are the young John Cena, that's a lot of pressure on Austin Theory, but I think he's one of those guys who's going to be able to handle said pressure, and he's going to be a big fucking deal. Hell, for all we know, SummerSlam 2023, Austin Theory could be the guy who topples Roman Reigns. Nobody's saying it right now, but with the fact that he is the... That he is pretty much the chosen one, right? Like Roman Reigns is the is the is the chosen one now. He is the guy who is holding the company on his back now. He is going to be putting Austin Theory over sooner rather than later. I am predicting between WrestleMania thirty eight or thirty nine next year and WrestleMania forty, Austin Theory is going to be the one to beat Roman Reigns. It wouldn't surprise me. But that is neither here nor there. Orton says the next generation of episodes won't be inspired by the Viper, a bro, or a nightmare. They will be inspired by a visionary, Seth freaking Rollins. 
Ezekiel went to the ring and apologized for interrupting but congratulates Orton and introduces himself as Ezekiel, the younger brother Elias. He recalls watching with his brother um, how Orton dominated as a legend killer. Owens comes through the crowd yelling about how Ezekiel is a lying, disgusting piece of trash. He says Ezekiel passed the lie detector test last week, which... If anyone doesn't realize that lie detector tests are not admissible in court because they were easy to get, you can easily um, beat them. I don't know what the point of doing a lie detector test is, trying to, you know, find comedy out of it. There's a reason they're not admissible in court because you can't trust them. They are not foolproof. Like, Elias Ezekiel could have went in there and said all, like, told a bunch of lies, and if he knows how to gain the system, you could beat the lie detector test. I hate lie detector tests because they're bullshit. Figures he, how, he said, but he will figure out how because he's the only one who's the same person here. Out comes the Usos. The Usos were called watching when they were, like, when they were 15 years old. They entered the ring and asked him what. I don't know if they have fa favorite Randy Orton moments. The favorite one was when he would beat, when they beat RK Bro and unify the tag team titles. The Usos go on talking some trash and raise their titles in the air. Two loud boos from the crowd. Adam Pierce comes out and says, "Before we tarnish the celebration, we're gonna make something clear. Orton will be in action tonight in form of the biggest match he can make on Raw." He announces Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, and the Usos versus Cody Rhodes, Elias, and RK Bro, which the fans pop. I knew this was going to happen. It's whatever. It's an eight-man tag team match. We all know how it goes. When you have a promo going on and you have like six or seven or eight people coming out here, it's going to lead to a tag team match of some kind or some kind of match. That's what we got here. Two teams argue in the middle of the ring. Orton, uh, Owens drops Elias with a punch out of nowhere. Orton drops Owens with another KO. The baby faces stand tall in the ring. Now Orton's music hits and the others look on. Wasn't a, it wasn't a terrible opening segment. Um, I was hoping Orton would have hit a couple RKOs on about a couple other people, but we're going to save that. They're going to save that for the main event. I wish they would have saved the RKO for the main event instead of having Owens hit, get hit with the RKO. Oh, but it's the RKO. We've seen a ton of them. Yes, but this is Randy Orton's, like, the big day of Randy Orton's 20th anniversary. I would have not had anybody, anybody hit, be hit with an RKO until that main event. We'll get into that later. Uh, Raw Women's Title Match, Sonya Deville versus Bianca Belair. And Sonya Deville didn't even get an entrance. See, um, Glenn Jacobs talking backstage with Bianca Belair, of course. So, in her hometown... Bianca Belair is from Knoxville. Kane, um, Glenn Jacobs, a.k.a. Kane, is the mayor of Knoxville. Last time they were in Knoxville was on SmackDown where Kane came, Glenn came out and gave her a key to the city, if I'm correct. Back for fake, Sonya Deville is getting ready for the ring. Out comes the champion. This match, they, get the, they got their former ring introduction. This match lasted about... Two and a half, like two minutes, as Bianca Belair threw her to the outside over the barrier, over the ring announcer's table. She gets back in the ring. Sonya Deville gets caught out, ca counted out. I'm like, oh, here we go. The ring announcer is about to announce the winner, and Sonya Deville's like, no, 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 that's not gonna happen. There's water over here. I couldn't do anything. We're gonna make this a no count out match. Didn't we just do this shit with her and Naomi when Naomi? Was in a match, and Naomi kept winning, so she had to change the rules over and over and over again. Abusing her power. We're really going down this route again? So the match again lasts about a minute and a half. Sonya Deville uses the chair and gets disqualified. Oh, no, 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 no. We can't have it in that way. She used her illegal object of her hair. Sonya, it's part of her body. It's not illegal. We've already been through this. So she had to make it a no DQ match. Why can't you just go to the no DQ match immediately? Everyone knows that a no DQ match also has no count out. God, this was stupid. So they restart the match again. Here comes Selena Vega and Carmella. Once these two broken up, back when come like back when they lost or like after the night after WrestleMania, when Sonya Deville blamed I'm not Sonya Deville. I'm sorry, Selena Vega blamed Carmella for their loss because she was too busy. Um. Being flirty with her um, husband. And then she beat her up and walked away. Now the buddy buddy again. What was the fucking point of the beat down. Of the breakup then. So they come out. They try to help Sonya Deville. It's a three on one handicap match basically. To try and get Sonya Deville the championship. 
In the end, Sonya Deville gets E to the KOD, 1-2-3, and Bianca Belair wins in her hometown. Good on her. She had to win the match three times, but it was fucking stupid. As you Damien Priest backstage somewhere, back to commercial break, back from break, we see how Bianca Belair fought off Carmella and Zelina Vega to retain the titles. The title, all three of the heels are backstage. Deville says they had one job since they didn't help her win the title. They're not getting a title shot. Vega yells at her about going back on her word. Deville delivers a hard slap to Vega. And she Carmella goes to slap her and Vega and Deville's like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Because I'm still an authority figure and I am your boss, so don't even think about it. And I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't you say you're only an authority figure when you have the suit on? Because if I correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, you weren't wearing your business suit at that time. You were still in your wrestling gear. So if Carmella would have slapped you, she wasn't slapping her boss. She was slapping another women's wrestler on the roster. It's time to drop Sony Deville from the ranks of authority figure she abused her power all the time when it came to naomi she abused her power tonight adam pierce should have came out and after the match was over or something and had said something they need to end her time as an authority figure the women's division needs her more than her being a fucking authority figure So AJ Styles was attacked backstage by Damian Priest and Hall of Famer Edge. Now, Edge says they looked down on everyone in the mouth of omnipotence. And if they got closer, they kicked them in the face and knocked them back. He says Finn Balor's days of execution ends tonight. He goes on and insults the local crowd with about the because they're in that the University of Tennessee, I think it is, and that of course is where the volunteers play, so they had to make fun of that. Cheap heat. And the voters who put Hall of Famer Kane in office as Mayor Clint Jacobs. Goes on with words for AJ Styles pointing out how they fo fo focused on his shoulder last week. He mentions how they are better than your favorites and that the statement is true so he needs to choke it down. He recalls how AJ didn't hit the phenomenal form at WrestleMania and he bet AJ can't hit it with his arm. At WrestleMania backlash, he warns him to stay at home, hugged his kids with the one good arm because it's over in his head and tells Ballard that he will see him later tonight. Priest says Finn's guilt has been determined and his punishment and... He says Balor's Judgment Day has arrived. He and Edge laugh as Edge tipped the scales of justice to end the segment. It was announced during Damian Priest's entrance that this group is now called Judgment Day. It's okay. Nothing else I can say about that. It's not a terrible name. It's not a great name. It's it's okay. It's We'll see how it goes because right now it's not a faction. It's just Edge and Damian Priest, a tag team or... A leader and a follower. We need more people. We need, like, Real Ripley, Ciampa, maybe even Mustafa Ali, anybody else to join this group. Come on! Took on Sam Smothers, killed him in about 30 seconds, beat him up in some more, and that was that. Obviously, last year's backstage throwing punches when Sarah Shriver walked up, pointing how this contest might not, this might not be the proper way to train for arm wrestling. He says he's pretty confident in his arm wrestling, but he doesn't. Because he's stronger, but he has to prepare because he doesn't put it past that no good snake of MVP. Then we go to the arm wrestling match. This is basically what happened. They lock up. They lock up. Omos looks to be getting an early advantage. MVP is talking trash the entire time. Says that Bobby Lashley is nothing without him. Bobby Lashley wins. After that, he gets he celebrates. Omos attacks him from behind as MVP distracts. Beats up um, Bobby Lashley and leaves him for dead. That was basically the arm wrestling match. <sighs> More 24-7, stupid shit I don't care about. Luka and Sazawa lost to... I, 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 I beat Deji and Dana. I don't care. Go back to me and out comes Becky Lynch for a return to Raw. This is Lynch's first appearance in dropping the title at back, out to Bianca Belair at WrestleMania 38. Takes the man, enter, takes her time entering, poses in the corner. We go back to commercial, back from break. She is wrapped in, uh, she wraps up entry. She takes the mic under the spotlight and mostly booze ring out in the crowd. She says, it's been three years since she walked out on Raw without her title. Three years since anyone could beat her for it. She wants to be honest. She didn't want to show her face without the title because she doesn't know who Becky Lynch is without it. She says she didn't recognize herself any longer after WrestleMania 38. She says she's hit rock bottom. That's all she wanted to say. She goes to drop the mic. 
It holds it down there. It holds it. Picks it back up. It's fans Chia. She bounces back up and says, Wait a minute, there's only one way to go because I'm already at rock bottom. There's only one way to go and that's up. If she's hit rock bottom, she gets fired up and now she says, This is the beginning of a legendary combat and no one does comebacks like she does. She can't stay down at the bottom with no with these slubs of earth. No, Lynch is standing on starting to sound a little crazy. Fans get the witness her rise back to the title when she overcomes the hometown star Bianca Belair. And no one will be able to stop her once she gets the Raw Women's Title Band. No one can stop her. Not Bianca, not Sonya, not Liv, not out comes Asuka. And Becky dropped the mic. This is her first appearance since Money in the Bank in 2021. She got injured and we haven't seen her since. Much in the ring, post in the corner, Lynch starts to stare her down. Fans cheer. And dances with fans channel. I guess she said she will stop Becky because no one is ready for Oscar. I love Oscar. I love her in ring work. I can't stand her English. She is her her English has not gotten any better. She has been with WWE since 2015. She's in NXT until 2017. She's been on the main roster for five years. Her English hasn't gotten any better. Please stop having her talk. Unless she's going to speak in Japanese and stop yelling and screaming. It's just go out there. Let her. Like the only thing she needs to say is nobody's ready for Oscar, which obviously people have been because you're not undefeated anymore. Becky sees she's pissed. She swings and misses. Oscar also misses a back fist as Lynch retreats to the floor. Lynch looks on the ramp as Oscar celebrates in the ring. The problem with this is it's too little, too late for this. Oscar it was gifted the title in 2020 by Becky Lynch. When Becky Lynch found out she was pregnant, they did the whole money in the bank thing. Becky gave um, the, the, the title was in the money in the bank briefcase, which nobody knew until we got to Monday Night Raw. Not even Oscar knew until I think a couple hours beforehand or didn't know at all. Then... Oscar went on to have a mediocre title reign because WWE doesn't give a shit. If you're not one of the four horsewomen, they're not going to give shit about you. If, I'm sorry, if you're not Bailey or Charlotte or Becky because Sasha Banks feels like a, th a fourth wheel on the, uh, the four horsewomen, they're not going to give a shit about you and they're not going to push you as well as they should. But if Oscar would have came back and it wouldn't have been Os it wouldn't have been Bianca versus Becky at WrestleMania, Oscar versus Becky would have made a lot more sense because Oscar and her they never would clash for the Raw Women's Championship because Oscar lost it. And yeah. She lost it what? Was it last year at WrestleMania? Yeah. Lost it last year to Rhea Ripley. Went on the money in the bank, lost there, did not haven't seen her since then. It would have been a lot better for them to actually have her come out. When, Beyond, when Becky Lynch was champion, if she was ready, but I guess she wasn't. Ah, uh, it is what it is. Finn Balor versus Damian Priest. They, uh, this, match was a, this match was a glorified squash. It really was. Finn Balor got very little in on Damian Priest. And Damian Priest won with driving him face first to the mat and won in less than five minutes, it felt like. We stand stall, we go to the replace, Priest marches up to the throne and bends the knee, then turns to the crowd and raises his fist in the air. And that was that. Miz TV with Miz and Theory, Austin Theory, I don't care. Mustafa Ali makes his return. Austin Theory and Miz make fun of the fact that this guy tried to leave. Miz is like, you still work here? And Austin is like, weren't you the guy who took your ball and went home? Obviously, Mustafa Ali comes out and he's like, I was hoping that Austin Theory would be having an open challenge and I could be the one to take it. Austin Theory is like, you know what? No. I'll think about it, but no. And then Miz gets, talk, gets, turned, gets put into a match against Mustafa Ali. He did make a funny joke. He's like, if he wants to laugh, he'll just watch Miz wrestle, which, yeah, no. If you want to fall asleep, you listen to Ron the Drowsy on SmackDown and you watch Miz wrestle because they're both boring. 
Miz, but we see Randy went backstage talking to Mayor Glenn Jacobs here in Knox, Valley, Knox County, Tennessee. And tonight, the, 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 the announcers hype up tonight's main event. Must Miz versus Mustafa Ali. We have this match here. It goes about maybe four minutes. Mustafa Ali wins with a roll up. That was that. After the match, Miz is recovering. Champa comes out of nowhere, blindsides Mustafa Ali, and just stands over him and looks down. And it looks like Ciampa is no longer Tommaso. He's just Ciampa, which, I'm going to be frank, it is not the worst name change we have seen in the last year. Raquel Rodriguez is not bad. Cruz del Toro is not bad because, you know, they're going to give somebody who they've been using their real name an actual new name. But I'm really surprised they didn't come up with something else. But Tommaso Ciampa is now just Ciampa. And let's face it. He's been called, he gets called Ciampa more on commentary than he does Tommaso Ciampa, so it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. It'll work out for him. It's I mean, it's his, he's been using the name. At least he got to keep Ciampa instead of being called a Tomato Tabali or something, like, or Tommy Bahama or something stupid, because you know they would probably give him a stupid name. Ciampa, that's fine. Mary Lipley is backstage. She says... She finally opened her eyes. When she first came here, she became Raw Women's Champion on her own. But since then, she's been tossed in tag division with partners who bring her down and make her weak. So she's done. She's done associating herself with and Liv Morgan attacks her. They start brawling. Officials break it up. And that was that. Cody Rhodes, Ezekiel. I'm sorry. Uh, Elias in the RK Bros. versus Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins, and SmackDown Tag Team Champions, the Usos. Eight-man tag team match all over the place. Oh, basically... The match came down to this. You get an RKO, you get an RKO, you get a go KO. Everybody on the heel team get RKOs by Randy Orton. And the babyfaces win with Randy Orton picking up the win. Everyone celebrates in the middle of the ring. Randy Orton gets cheered on by the Knoxville crowd. And that is the show Monday Night Raw. Uh, celebration of Randy Orton, it went, it was fine. I mean, yeah, Randy Orton get to go out there, have a match in one place. I guess he was born. That's pretty cool on him. Um, having, it looks like Cody vs. Seth, of course, is going to happen, as we know. Kevin Owens and, and Ezekiel are going to happen at WrestleMania Backlash, more than likely. And the Usos vs. OK, bro. Zelina, not Zelina. Liv Morgan and Ray Ripley will probably happen as well. Mustafa Ali versus Tommaso Chopper and Becky Lynch versus um, Oscar at the pay-per-view do seem like it'd be a little rush since the pay-per-view is, what, two weeks away? I think. Just, I don't know. Feels like it'd be rushing them because they just started them tonight. But overall, this was a meh episode of Monday Night Raw. I don't care for the 24-7 stuff. Rematch of Mania after rematch of Mania. They need to flat, they need to wrap up Sonya Deville as an authority figure. It just doesn't work anymore. She abused her power with Naomi. She abused her power tonight. They've got to say, listen, enough is enough. You're not an authority figure anymore. I have Vince come out, do the whole, as far as you are as an authority figure, you are fired, but you are going to be an active in-ring competitor, and that is it. Because the Raw, women, the women's division as a whole needs Sonya Deville more than her as an authority figure. That is your Monday Night Raw review. Hit that subscribe button. Comment down below. Like or dislike this video. Find me on Miles at the France Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash the France Club. And find me on Instagram at the France Club. And I will see you guys Wednesday for AEW as we head towards Double or Nothing. Well, then, my name is the France, and I'll see you guys later.